Hey everyone, welcome to the show, and I'm here with Larry. Larry, welcome back to the show. Uh, excited to have you here for another another chat. Yeah, I'm excited to be with you, Preston. I always enjoy our chats. So before we hit the record here, you had just made this really simple comment. I don't know how anybody's doing business in this environment. Right. And what what a comment because you know, how in the world is anybody pricing things when right. we're seeing these swings just in the commodities alone, let alone uh things that are second touch, third touch in the supply chain. I mean, sure. it's insane. Yeah, I mean, do we have massive inflation or do we have massive deflation? Yeah. It, 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 both, right? I mean, until until the Fed hit the brakes, we had massive inflation as a result of their prior actions. And now, um, you know, everything's turned on a dime and we're about to go into the Great Depression. So, so that would be my question for you. Do you see things really slowing down and are we going to see something like that or are we only going to see it in some particular well, commodities I mean, and sectors or yeah it all it all depends upon what their next moves are but you know let's just assume they stay on this path for a while you know they're going to successfully destroy some demand right i mean yeah um and we've we've already seen that we've seen the price of oil drop sharply we've seen the price of copper drop sharply you know we've seen a lot of financial distress i'm sure we'll get into that later in the show but it um you know we we, we know the housing prices are on a big spike and we know that mortgage rates have doubled. I mean, that's certain to reverse. I mean, I know anecdotally in the areas I visit and live in and watch real estate wise, there used to be bidding wars. And of course, that's all disappeared. Um, so it's it's as though somebody turned off the lights. I'm in the process of writing my quarter, second quarter report. And I just penned the phrase. I said, it's like the Fed showed up, turned off the lights, said the party's over, go home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and we're starting to see it. And, you know, it in a in a society in a system that's built on free money um you know you take away you know the heroin and and you know the addict is gonna have a have a withdrawal tantrum and that's that's we're in the beginning of that right now and what i think is most interesting is that you know um, the leading edge the bleeding edge of it has been uh, gold and bitcoin but those are just the two that are most sensitive to mm -hmm. what's going on with the money um i think you know what happened to gold and what happened to bitcoin is about to happen to stocks i I think the stock market is going to have an enormous accident in the next three months. Yeah. Um, you know, it, and the reason I say that is you look at it, it's a bubble. It was a bubble. We know that you look at the charts. I've got several in my report upcoming and we've corrected about 20% off the high. And when a bubble bursts, you don't correct just 20%, you know, and the S and P 500 in 2000, 2080 was down over 50%. The NASDAQ in the 2000 bubble was down over 80%. And so, you know, I think we can point to, areas where we know anything that was puffed up based on free money is about to have the wind taken out of its sails. I, I suspect real estate's going to come down. Um, obviously, we see oil and copper coming down. And I think the stock market's got a long way to fall. Yeah. It was priced for perfection, and we no longer have economic perfection. It is, it is unbelievable to me when I'm looking at the central bank balance sheet and the expansion of it and now the contraction of it and how correlated it is to your major stock indexes, yes. uh, the, the major ones, especially this recent COVID liquidity injection that that took yes. place and how correlated it is. It almost just seems like there's no, um, like we can talk about earnings and we can talk about all these, these micro ideas of valuation, but when I'm just looking at the macro, it's just dominating. The currency itself is just dominating everything. I mean, yes. everything. Yes. Yeah. I mean, these, these guys, you know, it's as Groman says, they're, you know, they think they're dealing with a, a real stat that they can change the temperature on slightly. And really they're, they're dealing with a nuclear reactor that's either on or it's off. Yeah. And when, you know, when it was on, things were running hot everywhere and we had a crack up boom underway. Of course they saw that late reacted to it, reacted to it violently um started you know reacting slowly and then of course nobody listened to them and they're like no no we're really we're serious <laughs> yeah and, and now you know paul is channeling his inner volker and and he is indicating he really is serious and um i think he's you know he can't pivot immediately he just can't he knows his credibility would be blown apart yeah and so he you know they're gonna have to create more pain and they will and the question is will something break or how much pain is it going to take before they do pivot 
When I look at the the global central bank balance sheets and I see how much they they stepped in, not on this most recent one, on the collectively across the globe on the major yeah. four central banks, it was about ten trillion dollars in this last right. go around. Before yeah. that, um, I want to say from like the twenty sixteen to about the twenty twenty period, it was a five trillion dollar uh, insertion of liquidity that they let fizzle out and then COVID hit. It looked like it was already starting to fall apart before COVID even happened. And I'm kind of curious if you think that did they step in with 10 trillion on this last round? Because up until that point, inflation was nowhere to be found. It was like, well, we've keep throwing these trillion dollars and trillions here and trillions there, and we can't get inflation anywhere as much as we try. So what the heck? Let's, let's, Let's go in big and let's give it ten trillion and see if we can even get inflation. And I mean, they got it obviously in a major ways. Is that was that an overreaction on their part? And they just completely got duped because they've been printing so much for literally a decade and never saw anything. I think that's probably right. I mean, I know there was a lot of talk. You know, you remember Cheney saying deficits don't matter. I mean, for a very long time, they've gotten away with a lot. And so they just figured, why not? I mean, we can we can do mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. And COVID looked like an existential threat, and it wasn't, but it looked like it. And they used it as an excuse to do what they wanted to do. Um, I don't know. It, it's it's so sad. I mean, all of these policies. I mean, these these guys are just the gang that couldn't shoot straight. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean they really. Uh, you know, I've said I've used the phrase of driving a clown car. They. They drove it into the inflationary guardrail. They bounced off that. Now we're headed towards the deflationary guardrail. You know, we'll see how long it takes until we bounce off that or if we break right through. I mean, they let this really get going. You know, we're going to have a severe economic downturn here. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, everyone's talking about the deflation that they've started to see over the last couple of weeks. And that's like the big story. I know CNBC, I mean, they're just covering it nonstop. But you don't see anybody talking about what you and Greg Foss and a few others are talking about, which is the CDS market. And oh, absolutely. Particularly yeah. banks, which I think is the real story here. And the the real canary in the coal mine as to the the fundamental issues that are cropping up in, in this disaster right now. Well, that's right. And and so that's that's the issue. I mean, we know that the Fed mandate, the three parts, right? Part one is is full employment. Part two is, you know, they've got that more or less. Part two, you know, is uh, controlled inflation. They obviously don't have that. And part three is is financial continuity or financial stability in the markets. And that's where, that's what they're going to lose, in my opinion. That's going to break. Um, and there's a lot of evidence of it. I mean, the Italian bonds blowing out in, in an emergency ECB meeting, I mean, that doesn't happen every day, right? I mean, you look at uh, the Japanese JGB market, you know, where they're using yield curve control, they're pinning it at 0.25, but overnight it trades up to 0.45. And they've had to bring, I think one chart showed they had to bring $80 billion to bear, you know, to, to buy more Japanese bonds. Um, the CDS markets, I just tweeted a chart today that showed the Credit Suisse CDS is almost as high as it was in the peak in 2008 is another indicator of it. Um, I'm sure there are some others that you can point to, but there, there are a host of factors that would seem to indicate that you know there are financial stresses popping up in the system in various pieces and you know the strong dollar is a wrecking ball right i mean yeah the dollar going straight up i mean sven hendricks had a great chart that just kind of showed how's that financial stability thingy coming when the dollar is just on a tear and going straight north and the whole world is based on dollar denominated debt and you know things are going to break i mean they're going to break in a lot of places if they continue with this policy and so but, you know, they have to because the politics indicate that they've got to get inflation under control and they want to try and maintain some shred of credibility. You know, to their credit, they admitted that they blew the last call. I don't know what they're going to say when they have to pivot here. I mean, I'm sure they're just going to say, well, you know, hopefully I, I think what they're praying for and, and they're probably pretty pleased to see the price of oil starting to come down. And I think what they're probably praying for is a month or two of good comps. I mean, you saw Powell say in his last press conference, if he got two months of good comparative uh, uh, inflation prints, i.e. down from 8.6, that, you know, they might think of backing off. And so, you know, since they can kind of cook that number, maybe they maybe they see where that might be possible. 
in the next few months. I don't know. I don't, you know, it could print double digits. Who knows? The numbers that come out of the government, I never really trust anyway. So, well, the, um, the numbers in Europe for me are even crazier because they're oh, yeah. they're getting eight and nine percent prints, and they haven't even budged on on uh, raising rates over there with the ECB. Well, that's right. I mean, it's oh, crazy. That's right. Well, and that's why the dollar is so strong. I mean, yeah. Look, Japan's a really interesting case, and Luke wrote about this recently. I mean. What's Japan going to do? I mean, and mm. what's the world going to do? I mean, you know, the Japanese currency is going to fall substantially and they're going to have massive inflation because they import all their oil. So, you know, look, it's 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 one hell of a show. It's no way to run a railroad. And, um, you know, it's making it very tough for all investors, you know, even sound money investors. But it is what it is. I mean, it, it, you know, the Myrmican chart is very informative, right? I mean, and, you know, before a system blows apart, it gets really volatile. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, you know, don't use leverage and know what you own and know why Amen. you own it, you know, um, because I mean, look at, look at the crypto space outside of Bitcoin. It's just been annihilated and there's probably a lot more to go. You know, I think so. I think you're right. Yeah. I think yeah. you're right. I mean, so, it's, it, and it's a lesson and I think it's a lesson for what's, what's to come in traditional markets that yes. I think a lot of people in traditional markets, especially if you're under the age of 35 or 40 years old, have never experienced because they've never gone through the 2008 and how how much uh, counterparty risk explosions there are. Everyone in, in, the, in the digital asset space is experiencing that right now, and they're seeing how quickly that type of stuff happens. But I think in traditional markets, there's going to be a wake-up call here in the coming quarter or two with respect Absolutely. to some of that stuff, yeah. If your investment perspective is 2008 to today, the the correct you know response at any point of a pullback has been to buy the dip. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, the dip buyers in the first quarter just got their ass handed to them, and there are probably some people buying the dip right now, and they're going to get their ass handed to them. Yeah. I mean, I fully believe, and this is just you know, I'm wrong all the time, so don't bet on this. But personally, my gut tells me the market's going down another 10 to 30 percent in the next three or four months. Yeah. And that's going to wake some people up. I mean, market down 20%, that's bad. Everyone knows we're hurting and everyone knows things are changing. The market goes down another 10 or 20% and you're going to start to see people thinking, Hold on. you know, this is my savings. This is my retirement. I'm scared. I got to get out you know, I got to cut back. I got to do whatever I got to do. Um, and everyone and, who's out over their skis is going to be in trouble. And Larry, what would you say is the is the rash? So a person would hear that and be like, "Well, why do you think that? Is it the negative spread that you're still seeing between inflation prints and and the yields on everything?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's that, and it's it's also just it's also just look. The Fed doesn't have any good choices right now, and so you know we can criticize what they're doing, but you know they almost anything they do would be wrong. The, the you know it it more has to do with sim the symmetry of bubbles. I mean, you know this bubble got so far out of whack that, you know, it's just, it's not going to down 20%. That's a rounding error. You know, yeah. this thing, this thing is overvalued by three X. I mean, for the value buyer to start stepping into the stock market, it's got to be at least 30% lower than it is today. Mm -hmm. It's already down 20%. So that would mean, you know, a 50% wipeout. I mean, Ronnie Stofferly had a great tweet on Twitter. It showed that um, $31 trillion of global stock and bond wealth has disappeared in the last six months. 31 trillion. US GDP is 20.1 trillion. Okay. So we've wiped out one and a half years worth of US GDP in asset valuations. That's going to leave a mark. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And 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 by the way, it's going to get worse because you know, people are going to look at those stocks and they're going to fear losing more. And they're going to say, I need that money to pay for these higher gasoline bills. I need it to pay for my, you know, higher interest costs on my house. I mean, you know, this is just everybody, you know, it's it's the sad thing. It's what happens when you have a roller coaster bust and boom economy based on a Fed that's mispricing the cost of money. I mean, this thing happened in the 29 period. I mean, a quick personal story. My grandfather was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He was in the home furniture sales business out of a house. And the 20s were so big and so good for him that he was selling furniture hand over fist and he selling it out of the first floor of his house. It wasn't big enough. So he went to the bank in 27 or 28 and he borrowed a bunch of money and he doubled the size of the house. He turned it into a store. So now he had a larger furniture store where he could sell the furniture out of. That was in 1928. He got the wrong signals from the Fed. We went over the top. 
the economy collapsed. He had, you know, five or six employees. He was doing great. And of course, nobody would buy any furniture because nobody had any money. Mm. And throughout the 30s, he spent the whole 30s. He and his wife ran it solo. And he went every week. He had to go to the bank and beg them not to foreclose. Mm. And all because the Fed printed money and stoked the stock market bubble of the 20s and led business people to make the wrong decisions. Yeah. And, you know, that's what's happened here. I mean, all the money in cryptocurrencies, the wrong decision. All the money in NFTs, the wrong decision. You know, there's, there's been there's been a ton of malinvestment. And when you have broken money, which is what we have, you have interest rates that don't represent the true cost of capital, you end up getting huge misallocations. And then everybody wakes up to the misallocation and says, oh, my God, we blew it. And, you know, suddenly everything resets to a, a new set of prices. They're more in line with reality. And that's what we're going through right now. And, and you know, we've just begun. I mean, Look, the, the first quarter, most of the stock indices were down mid to high signal digits. Now the stock indices are down 20%. And I know people who are saying, oh, you know, this is still not that big a deal. It'll recover. This is a good buy. No, it's not. This is a bubble bursting. And we've seen the pattern that happens when bubbles burst. They go back to their base. And we're a long way from the base. I have charts in my report that will show that. And there, are, there are a lot of charts out on the web. John Hussman has done a great job of documenting how overvalued stock market is. It's got a long way to fall, in my opinion. And that negative wealth effect is going to be a big deal. You yeah. know, I mean, people, I know a lot of people who thought they were wealthy based on the stocks they own. They take their stocks down 50% and they're not going to go buy that new car and use leverage to do it. You know, their, their, their lives are going to change. Especially uh, with interest rates being. Yeah, moderate. and interest yeah. rates are going up and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, Again, it's just, it's sad. It's, it's really, really sad the way we allow a committee of people to set the most important price in the world. That's just, it's tragic. It causes enormous human pain. I mean, think of the human pain that people went through in 2008. I mean, I was in the business at the time. You know, my sister lost her house. Um, a lot of people lost their jobs. Uh, a lot of people lost their houses. I mean, you know, these, these, this boom bust cycle is, you know, it's enormously painful and it, it turns everybody into a gambler and a speculator rather than being just, you know, an honest citizen trying to add value and build businesses. And, you know, you can't build businesses when the price of capital is grossly mispriced because what happens is people speculate and, you know, the speculators get rich theoretically on paper until it, before it ends. And then they get wiped out. The people who follow them get wiped out too. It's it's very it's a very bad system as, as you know. <laughs> I, I want to shift gears real fast, uh, sure. Larry. So the futures manipulating the spot price of commodity markets, and it comes down to the settlement. Explain some of this for people in a in a really simple way that that um, if you were if you were trying to explain it to somebody who really doesn't even understand the context of the question, lay it out for them, and then I just I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts on Bitcoin yeah, versus great, other commodities. Yeah, it's a great question. I'll do the best I can on it. I mean, you know, in theory, if if you and I are trading something back and forth, we have the physical thing and we set a price and we sell it and we deliver the thing back and forth. But let's say some let's say a third friend showed up and and said, you know. Um, you don't necessarily want the physical thing. I'll sell you a paper claim on the physical thing because you're not going to use it right away. And and by the way, I've got a ton of those paper claims and I'll put them all on the market and I'll put them all on the market at a lower price or a higher price, whatever. And the, that, that's a futures contract. And that futures contract can manipulate the underlying price of the thing itself. And if the futures market becomes, because every every sale is created at the margin based on a price and the futures price and the spot price tend to track one another. And so if somebody comes along and introduces a bunch of paper futures or paper claims on something and introduces them to the market and sells into it, they can drive down the price because they've pretended that they have something they don't have, but they've, and they've created a paper claim and supply. And it all works until the person who bought the paper claim says, give me the real thing. Okay. Um, that's what's been going on in the gold market for decades and in, in enormous size and the paper contracts in gold are hundreds of times the underlying physical commodity itself. And that's how they've suppressed the price. And that's why, you know, if we use the 71 standards, the price of gold today would be $80,000 an ounce plus, but it's not because there's a lot of paper gold that's been used to suppress the price. 
This is beginning in Bitcoin, but it's very early days and it's much smaller. Um, the way we measure it in the paper in the gold space is you look at the total derivative context outstanding, you divide it by the physical trade, and you know we get the hundred to one ratio. Today, Bitcoin, and I just checked it on Coin Market Cap. Bitcoin's trading about twenty billion dollars worth of value a day, and the total outstanding glass node tells us that the total outstanding Bitcoin futures contracts are about twenty billion dollars. Is so, that cash or is that? Sp- well, it's ca- it's ca- the futures are cash settled. They don't have the Bitcoin, but that's just an agreement between that's me selling you a Bitcoin that I don't have, and you agree. And and so at the end of the day, when we close that contract out, however the prices move, either I owe you money or you owe me money. Mm-hmm. But neither of us have a coin at the time. It's just mm-hmm. a futures contract, an agreement at some point in time when it gets closed out. And so, you know, with twenty billion outstanding and twenty billion trading a day, and twenty times you know three sixty five. So I don't know. There's seven hundred. There's you know seven hundred billion dollars worth of Bitcoin trading a year. There's roughly just under four hundred billion dollars worth of Bitcoin out there, and the futures market is twenty billion. I don't think the futures market in Bitcoin today is manipulating the Bitcoin price that much. I mean, these are not the kind of ratios and numbers that exist in the gold market, which is heavily manipulated. Having said that, the twenty million has grown steadily over time. And somebody on your thread asking questions did a nice chart that showed how it's been slowly but consistently getting larger. Mm-hmm. And you know the the reason the people were able the reason the governments were able to manipulate the gold market is they had unlimited balance sheets and they used Cayman Island entities and the BIS and lots of other proxies, including J.P. Morgan, to basically sell this paper into the market and suppress the price. And they had a printer, and I think they do all this stuff off balance sheet, and they can make up for whatever losses are necessary. And they view it as in the national strategic interest to hold the price of gold down because it makes the dollar look stronger. Mm. And my sense is when Bitcoin went from five thousand to fifty thousand dollars, that somebody and the alarm bells went off at the government and said, "We can't have this thing be a threat to fiat." And and they started thinking and becoming more active in this market. But how active they are, I don't know. But as I said earlier, the numbers we just talked about are not big enough numbers that I think they're it's a, you know the tail wagging the dog yet. But it's something to watch. Caitlin and I have talked about it because they could become bigger, and it could become an issue. One thing that defends Bitcoin kind of makes it like a porcupine is that gold never goes up 5x in a six month time frame. Mm-hmm. And so if you're manipulating gold, and you're JP Morgan and so on and so forth. I mean, they're pretty good at selling it when it looks hot and then waiting for it to cool off and buying it back. So they can actually even make money on the manipulation by capping it and buying, you know, creating negative sentiment and buying it when it's cheap. Um, but, you know, as I say, gold doesn't do five baggers in six months. Okay. Bitcoin, I mean, the volatility, which some people criticize, it actually is a defense mechanism for Bitcoin, because if JP Morgan were to nakedly go get short Bitcoin in the futures market without having the government backing them up, and then, you know, Bitcoin were to do one of its traditional five bagger runs, where it went from, say, you know, call it 40,000 to 200,000, you know, that would that would rip their face off. And they would need the backstop of the government to protect them from it. So the volatility in, in Bitcoin actually, I think, will help it to be less subject to futures manipulation because, and hedge funds too. I mean, you don't necessarily want to short something that's got a fixed supply and that can go up and has historically gone up 5X in multiple times, right? That, that can be a dangerous trade. So, uh, you know, my hope is that we'll be able to, Bitcoin will be, be able to crash the fiat system in a time frame that allows us to get Bitcoin oriented people into government that allows us to ban these derivatives in general, because derivatives allow the person with the biggest balance sheet to win. And the government has the biggest balance sheet by definition. And that's, that's part of what's broken. Do you think the ease of taking a uh, physical settlement also helps defend you were, you're talking about definitely, it definitely does. And it's, yeah, somebody else made this point in another podcast I was on recently that yes, gold, the fact that gold was lent itself to derivatives is so hard to divide and move mm-hmm, and settle mm-hmm. on. Yeah. It also led to the derivative markets. And yes, it, it definitely helps. But don't make no mistake about it. You know, if if the government through, you know, the Fed, the Treasury, the CIA, whoever it might be, decided that it was in the national interest to have a lower Bitcoin price, they could figure out a way to get into the futures market and probably make that happen. They've done that with gold. Do you think that this is all part of the reason of why you're not seeing a spot ETF? being approved? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Doomberg had a great piece on that, which I recommend everyone to read. He just retweeted it this morning. Um, There's no doubt 
you know, they approved the futures, they didn't approve the spot ETF. I mean, the futures are just people gambling on the price and they want people gambling on the price, especially on the short side. Spot ETF takes money out of their system. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, what they don't want, they want to keep people locked in their system. They, they want to block the exits. And gold is an exit and Bitcoin is an exit. They want to block those exits very, very clearly. And now, an ETF is an exit. Yeah. So, so with that said, there's a whole bunch of other countries in the world that aren't uh, blocking a spot ETF. That's right. And so um, is this one of those things that all you can do is kind of put some uh, bandages on the on the uh, wound, but the, the patient's well, going to bleed out? Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I'm not sure that, you know, that, I mean, two things and your questions ask this. I mean, one is GBTC is an alternative, right? Although it sells at a discount and I'm very well at risk of not your keys, not your coins. I know the people there. I think they have the, the coins they say they have, but, you know, obviously it's a honeypot and there's always risk there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it's it's definitely an issue that, that they have not done it. And, uh, you know, back to Gensler for a minute. I strongly believe that Gensler has faced enormous pressure from the banking lobby and the treasury and, and to, to not approve this thing. I mean, I, I can't, I can't imagine, you know, they approved a short Bitcoin ETF, didn't they? As I recall. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right. I mean, what's that all about? You can have one where you can short it. We'll approve that, but we won't let you have a regular ETF. I mean, what more do you need to know, right? I mean, is he is he hooking is he hooking the plebes up? Is he hooking the uh, people who, who have a long? Well, I'm saying it more in terms of if you have a very long view on it, and you just your goal is to accumulate as much as possible in the coming ten years. I mean, you could make the argument that he's doing all those people a favor by allowing oh, the price yeah. to get suppressed. Very possibly, yeah. Very yeah. possibly. I'm not sure. I'm not sure he necessarily sees that way, but you and I look, you and I looking at it, it's yeah. like, yeah, I mean, yeah, if it forces people to learn how to self custody, yeah. that's a good thing, right? I mean, it's, yeah. an ETF is is a third party, and you know they're they're all inferior. I mean, it's it, you know, and GBTC is inferior. There and there are risks with GBTC, and I recognize those, but it's a small piece of my Bitcoin holdings. But I, I like I like how easy it is to 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 trade in it, and I like I like the fact that there is some chance that over time the discount will go away. I mean, I, I think oh, the yeah. pressure, they're, they're suing the government and mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure where that'll go. I've heard various legal people tell me different sides of that, but I, I think it's not, it's not inconceivable that they'll win the suit. Um, and if that happens, there'll be an instant 30% pickup because you're trading at a nice discount. Yeah. Yeah. So. This question here, I think is unfair and uh <laughs> That's all right. I'll take it. And difficult to, near the world's impossible. unfair, Preston. You know that. <laughs> near impossible to answer. People want to know, when do you think the, the central bankers collectively yeah. are going to pivot here? And when are they going to go back to their QE or additional yield curve control? I mean, Japan's still QE. I mean, they're doing yield cur- curve control. It's QE on steroids. So, um, but- I'm, not, I'm not smart enough to know. And I mean, I know Luke thinks it happens, you know, within days, if not months. I mean, it could happen tomorrow. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, I mean, show me a stock market collapse in the middle of July where or show me a March 2020 like market event and, and you'll have your pivot. Yeah. I mean, in, in March of 2020, the, the you know, the Treasury bond market went no bid and your pivot occurred. Bang. And so that could happen in a week. Is it going to happen in a week? Probably unlikely. But it could, um, and which is why, you know, it's so hard to, you know, I, I haven't traded out of my risk asset positions in spite of the fact that I'm getting punched in the face every day for the last, you know, three months. Um, you know, I think a more likely probability is that, um, you know, and, and I think there, you can kind of see this. I mean, there's an election coming up and, you know, he said he wants a couple of months of down and kind of feels to me like this fall. You know what I mean? That, that yeah. you know, September, October. I completely agree with you on that. That's kind of how it feels. Yes. You know, they'll they'll forgive. They'll you know they'll say, well, they'll, they'll be able to claim they're beating inflation, which they're not, but they'll be able to claim they are. Oil prices will be down a bit. Gas will come in a bit. You know, unemployment will you know be going up for sure, but you know things won't be desperate. The stock market will have come down a good bit more. They'll forgive the student debt. And then they'll pray that they can win the election, and and you know. Oh, you be think a lot that's going to happen before the election, then? Oh yeah, yeah really? Gonna, oh yeah, they need those really? millennial votes. Yeah, oh I, think I think they're going to forgive all that student debt before the election. Really? Oh, absolutely. 
not, not all of it, but like a 10,000 kicker. Well, the 10,000 is done. I mean, they've already signaled that, but I think they might, I think they might forgive all of it. Yeah. You know? Oh my Lord. Oh yeah. I mean, why not? Right. It's, it's money for the people. You, you know, know, I've, but, I've said though to people and I'm not trying to defend any of this by any shape of the imagination, but I say to students that are, that are going down that path that they want the student forgiveness. I'm like, if you have any idea how much money they have pumped into the bond market over the last decade, it makes oh, yeah. the trillion or whatever they would throw at that particular problem look like a joke. Absolutely. Like, it would be a total joke. And, yeah. um, yeah. yeah. So, so the answer on the pivot is, I don't, and, and who knows? I mean, Look, if you want to get conspiratorial about it, you know, the the boomers who have the money that are like Powell, they actually want their dollars to hold their value. And and he does want to go down as Volcker and maybe he doesn't pivot and maybe and maybe he really does drive this thing into some kind of a depressionary condition wherein they think it'll be easier to put in a CBDC and to use UBI. And I mean, think about. I mean, you know, they're not going to be they're not going to be at a CBDC. I mean, I think technically they just they're not even close to being able to roll something like that out. You're probably right, but they've got guys at MIT working on it. They had a task group. I don't know. I just don't know. But I, I'm just saying that, you know, if, as you game theory it out, you have to ask your question of, could they continue to be hawkish for a very long time? I mean, the answer is they can. The stock market's going to go to zero. You know, well, I think the, even the economy beyond- is gonna, The economy is going to grind to a halt. I think that, you know, I think you're going to have so much- so many issues in Europe and Japan by the fall to, to winter yes. that they are going to be screaming, screaming for them to, you know, ease up on the dollar. Like the dollar has got to get weaker. Yeah. Well, um, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll create new programs. I mean, they're going to probably give Japan swap lines, right? And maybe we'll start buying Jap- Japanese bonds. You know, I, I think it's entirely possible that if the stock market goes down another 20%, somebody's going to float the idea of, you know, maybe the U.S. government needs to support the stock market. I mean, Switzerland does it. You know, other countries do it. Um, you know, it'll be the Save the USA's 401k program, you know, or IRA program. And, and you know, they're going to try everything they can to extend their broken system as long as they can. And that's, yeah. you know, they're, they're the ultimate can kickers. And, you know, they'll just, they'll keep taking another swipe at kicking the can. And what's so sad about it all is it just, it hurts people. It hurts us. It makes it very, very hard. Even when you understand what's going on, as I think you do and I do, and probably most of the listeners of this podcast do, it still makes it tough to figure out what to do. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're just, we're just trying to stay on the right side of the trade. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not concerned with, you know, becoming a gazillionaire you know, I'm just trying to de- defend what I got, you know, so that I can, you know, retire and, and feel like I'm secure in my old age. And uh, and I know a lot of people listen to that probably feel the same way. Hey, everybody. Trey Lockerbie here from We Study Billionaires. And I wanted to tell you about a new company that I absolutely love, and that is called Trade. Trade combines two of my favorite things, coffee and technology. So what you do is you go to drinktrade.com. There's a super simple survey that you take, and then it tells you which coffee they're going to send you that you are literally guaranteed to love. Meaning if you don't love it, they'll send you a new bag of coffee for free. And from there, you can keep experimenting so you're not falling into the same rut of drinking the same coffee over and over and over again. There are so many different types of roasters, levels of roast, beans from different parts of the world. There's plenty to nerd out on here. So why not be adventurous and try some new stuff? After I took the quiz, they sent me a bag from Sight Glass Coffee in Northern California, and it's literally my favorite coffee of all time. Normally, I've been drinking a coffee where I have to sweeten it with honey and almond milk, but this coffee... I could actually drink it black. It was so delicious just on its own. And right now, Trade is offering subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking the quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let Trade find the perfect coffee for you. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off if I was going to just kind of hit that with an exclamation is so when we talk about how they could pivot tomorrow, they could pivot next week, they could pivot by the fall, a person who's sitting in risk on or equities or however you want to phrase that you're, you're caught in this situation where if you pull your money out right now, you're going to pay an enormous amount of capital gains, depending on how long you've been sitting on the the position. 
Um, especially with the bump that you got for, since COVID, you're going to pay a lot in capital gains. And is that going to be enough by the time, assuming you're right, that it's going to continue to sell off? Are you able to buy it back at a level before they pivot again? And so it's almost like, what do you do? You just kind of, kind of sit there like, like somebody's robbing you and do you run or do you stand there yeah, and hope that they was, change their mind or like yeah, what's going it's on? It's a great, it's a great question. But I, but I, again, I think, I think, look, w- with respect to bonds, I think it's pretty easy. I mean, I think we know that they have to either let the whole system collapse. They, you know, it, it's debase or default. So I think bonds are pretty easy to get out of. I think even when they pivot, there will be a serious equity bounce but we're not going back to the conditions ex ante. I mean, we're not going back to those bubble conditions. Those bubble conditions were outrageous. I mean, people people don't understand just how overvalued the stock market was. I mean, look at you know, look at Arc, look at look at all the names that were in there, and look at what's happened to those names. I mean, look, there will be good things to buy at the bottom of the stock market, but we're not even in the zip code of cheap yet. I mean, we've still got another fifty to sixty percent to fall. So I would not worry if I had stock positions with big capital gains, I would sell them down hard unless they were in commodity producers or, mm, yeah. you know, I, I think there's been a big shift. I mean, one thing we do know for sure is there's been a big secular shift from the disinflation theme to the inflation theme. We've underinvested in commodity and oil production and, you know, oil's correcting now and it'll probably correct some more. But I think, I think in this new environment, we're talking about the next 10 years as being an environment that's basically inflationary and basically favors commodities versus technology. I mean, the, if you look at the ratio of technology companies to commodity companies, it just got so far out of whack. And that's got to mean revert. And so, you know, if I had big gains in oil stocks, I wouldn't necessarily sell them. You know, they might come down a bit because they've run up nice and heavily here. Um, but I, you know, I don't think we're going to see $30 oil again in our lifetimes. Um, you know, in, unless we have the Great Depression. And I, I don't think, I think they will stop before we have the Great Depression. That's one other thing I wanted to add to the pivot comment. Keep in mind that the longer they wait to pivot, okay, fine, that's painful, painful for all of us who are in things that aren't benefiting as a result of that. But what it does, what it means, and it's, of course, it, you know, they were they were late on attacking inflation and then look how aggressive they had to be just to get oil to come down 20 bucks. Okay. If they're going to be late on pivoting, you know, it's, and when they do pivot, it's going to be because things are pretty bad and they are going to have to print until their eyes bleed, you know? So, so, I mean, they could pivot right now and maybe wouldn't have to be as accommodated and they could do kind of a soft pivot and maybe just talk back off the rhetoric. And that's what they're going to try to do. I mean, they're going to try to drive the road somewhere between massive inflation and massive deflation. I mean, I can see why they got as hawkish as they got. I mean, things were pretty frothy. I mean, we all saw it, right? Yeah. Inflation was out of control. They had to do something, and they did it. And so, but to be, to, you know, if, if I were in their shoes and I were running it today, you know, I would pivot sooner rather than later. I think they've got a better chance of keeping their system together longer, you know, if they if they don't go too far in this direction. Because once this becomes self reinforcing, you know, it's going to be very hard. It's you know, they could pivot now and maybe not have to print any more money. You know, if the if the stock market falls apart and the bond market continues to fall apart, which it would be ironic if it did in, in in light of a deflationary backdrop, but it could if people are losing faith in bonds, then you know you're you're going to have, you know, they're going to have to print like crazy to get to get us out of that deflationary spiral, right? I mean, which happened so fast, which has happened very fast, and so yeah. the last time, I mean. You know, the last time what we did three trillion in QE one, two, and three, we did five trillion this time. I mean, what's the next one? Ten? Well, one? collectively, I would tell you from from a global yeah. central bank standpoint, it was ten on on the COVID. Ten on the, yeah. I'm thinking I'm t- I was talking U.S. Just numbers. U.S. Yeah, yeah. same difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it'll be twenty, right? So it's it's very problematic uh, for them, obviously. Here's an interesting question that I'm curious to hear your thoughts on. How do you see Russia getting what they want? And then what is it that they want? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I really don't know what they want. I can't get inside that guy's head. I know what he doesn't want. What he got fed up with was being paid in script for yes. things that were real. Yes. He, and, he, and he finally said, okay, enough is enough. 
and you've gone too far. And I can see you're out over your skis. I can see you've manipulated the price of gold. I can see you've created a world that really benefits you. And I'm going to throw sand in those gears. You know, that I, it, it's not working for me. He doesn't want and, the paper promises. Yeah. And I just don't want these paper promises anymore. And so they're my commodities. It's your problem. And, um, you know, I've contended. I mean, I don't, I don't love the guy. Um, he's not stupid, though. Um, I've contended all along. I mean, and our leaders are such idiots. I mean, I, I think truly, you know, again, he's, he's an evil guy in many ways. But truly, a part of what he wanted here was just a seat at the table. And we haven't just given him basic human respect. And we argue because he's a bad guy, he doesn't deserve that. And I would submit that, no, he's a human and he runs a country that's got nuclear weapons. We owe him basic human respect and we haven't given it to him. And I think that's what caused him to throw sand in the gears. And it's, it's sad because I don't think this war needed to happen and people are dying. And, um, you know, we, we made a lot of promises to him that we broke. And, uh, you know. With um, respect to the, the NATO. With uh, respect to NATO and yeah. expansion and everything else. I mean, you know, I mean, he's, if Ukraine were to become, were to have missiles and we were, you know, and, and were to become part of NATO, I mean, you know, we would have a nuclear strike capability in under an hour from the Ukraine to Moscow. I mean, this would be like, you know, missiles in Cuba or to us. And, you know, I mean, I can understand why the guy's not, you know, exactly thrilled about that. And so, you know, it, it's but again, you know, we're run by a bunch of people that are beholden to the military industrial complex. And, you know, they keep giving the Ukraine you know, billions of dollars and those billions flow right into the coffers of Raytheon and Lockheed and everybody who's supplying, you know, these guys with the, the weapons of war. And that's good for those companies and the senators that live in those states. I mean, it's, it's sick stuff and it just shouldn't be going on, but it is. And so, and again, it's all, it's all fueled by the fiat money. We, we've got to drain the swamp and the, the way we drain the swamp is we get rid of fiat. Um, and the way we get rid of fiat is we, push and support and develop and um, go with the alternatives, non-state money, gold and Bitcoin. And, you know, Bitcoin's the fastest growing and, and the sharpest spear, but gold is there too. I mean, there are people who don't like the volatility of Bitcoin, so gold's a decent choice for them. I so. mean, at the end of the day, the, the paper promises have ruled ruled the world for 40 years oh, yeah. that's been oh, the yeah. environment and it and yeah. it seems like we're at a very and you, you saw this with the zoltan piece that came out i don't know how many months ago where it's really kind of money that is backed by energy itself is going to kind of rule the coming decades um you know i'm obviously very biased in that i think i know what what uh, energy money it is, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, look, I'm with you. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I'm a maximalist and I think Bitcoin will beat gold out over time. I just think there's a role for gold in the transition. Yeah, no, I mean, look, the fact that we didn't, the fact that we don't have a neutral reserve currency and that we created Triffin's dilemma by being, you know, the military power of the world and the monetary standard of the world. I mean, it's, it's hurt us in many ways that we didn't foresee. I mean, look at the Midwest. I mean, we hollowed out our entire manufacturing base. I mean, hell, we couldn't even go to war with China basically because they have stuff we need. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we couldn't build, you know, all the modern stuff we need without a relationship with China. And, you know, the world is such now that we, we all need each other. And, um, and, and I think if you really look at the core of, of decent human beings, and the world has many of those, although there are a few psychopaths, um, most decent human beings just want fair play. And so, you know, and, and, you know, a neutral reserve currency would lead to fair play, whereas it's very obvious that, you know, um, having a reserve currency controlled by one set of politicians who can manipulate that currency does not lead to fair play. Mm -hmm. And so th that's really the fundamental issue. So, you know, we, we, we got to we got to get we got to get to a neutral reserve currency. But we will because, you know. I think it was, it was you that said the contractions are getting closer, right? I mean, yeah, speeding up. I mean, I mean it's it's picking up. I mean, this is. I mean, I, I can't believe what's been going on. I mean, the you know, I'm, I feel like I'm in an airplane and the dials are starting to go nuts. I mean, I don't know if I'm yeah. upright or upside down. It's it's you know, it's like the AI. It's like the attitude indicator just tumbled, and I'm like, you know, which way's up? And this is I, a mess. I can only imagine if you're a capital intensive business that right. requires a lot of capex. And, uh, here you are buying materials and, right. and 
do I do I stockpile them or do I try to get them out the door as fast as possible? Because that's the that's the shift in thinking that just happened over the last yeah. two weeks, right? right. Like, do I do, I do I long term contracts or do I do short term? contracts? Imagine yeah. you're a home builder. Oh my you know? god! Yeah. Do, do, do I build that next set of homes? Mortgage rates just yeah. doubled. I mean, and it's you know what? Like, hard. And when you look across like the the things that are constructed and built here in the in this country and all around the world, right? A house is really not that complex. Like you're dealing with, you know, a, I, I could go through and name the, the pieces and parts, but when you get into some of these other technologies, like a laptop computer, or I mean, and that's not oh, even, yeah. all that. I mean, it's at a whole different level of complexity and oh, ordering absolutely. and stockpiling parts and pieces and just trying yeah. to yeah. do economic calculation on that in this environment. Right. I just can't even imagine. No. And the metaphor I've used, it's kind of like the Fed is swinging this wrecking ball around. I mean, it yeah. just made it, and, and it, it, you know, I mean, isn't it ironic that, so part of the reason why we have these commodity price inflation is because we haven't invested enough in all the productive capacity that we need, Yes. you know, right? I mean, we've underinvested in commodities. And so, you know, now when we need them and things are tight, we have a commodity price inflation. Okay. So what's needed? More CapEx in those areas to create more production. Okay. Well, what would, what would you like to have in order to do more CapEx? What would you like to have? Low interest rates. Well, what are we doing? We're raising interest rates. Yeah. So we're making that CapEx more expensive. And once again, it's because, you know, because the capital was mispriced, we didn't invest in the right things. And that and that's yeah. you know, how can you, I mean, we were we were trying you're trying to build a house with a with a measuring stick that, you know, that I mean, imagine your measuring tape just kept changing. You just can't do it. Yeah, you're seeing it with the oil industry right now, where they're like, well, "You need to produce more," and they're like, uh, "Yeah, no, we're we're good. We're not going to make any investments in that because they know what's coming next it, because they've seen it for a decade straight. Is they've made a little bit of margin, and now they want them to reinvest that in their into their capex and to expand and and do all those things. And they're like, uh, "No, I think we're good. Like, we don't want to go out and and do that risky type thing only for you to to." Well, I was going to say, it doesn't help when the president is saying that they're evil profit mongers, yes. that they're going to get yeah. taxed, so on and so forth. I mean, yeah, there, there's no industrial policy here. There's no thought. You know, there's just a bunch of wokeism, stupid people, you know, running running our government. And, uh, you know, Lynn talks about the comparisons, and I think Dalio's pretty big on talking about the comparisons to the 1940s. And I think that there are a lot of parallels, but when, when I'm looking at these types of behaviors and you look at the, at the just sheer stupidity <laughs> of, of, of where we're at right now and, and the demand for handouts and the demand for let's not do anything, let's just print it and hand it into, and stuff it into the hands of everybody with more paper promises. I don't think that you had that cultural mindset back then. No, I, I know you didn't. From from the experience of my grandparents, I mean, you know, the whole the whole notion of taking help was something to be very embarrassed about. Whereas now, it's you know, it's almost like people feel entitled to it. Yeah, and I know. I know in the student loan forgiveness, um, you know, a lot of people feel like it's their right, and they they just should have those loans forgiven. And what does that say about everybody who paid those loans? You know, it's it's just I, again the. Um, Fiat money corrupts everything and corrupts the morals of society all the way through. You know, it leads to profiteering. It leads to the wrong incentives. It, it you know, and, and we're so far gone, Preston. I mean, it's really sad. We are so far gone that it's going to take a really Pain. difficult and brutal, painful collapse for people to go back to the basics and learn some of those fundamental lessons. But I sincerely believe that that will happen and that people will learn those lessons that there there's a remnant of good hardworking honest people in this country in fact it's it's the largest group of people in the country and that you know they will help one another and um you know we'll we will go back to some timeless values that will make this a much better place it was much more the way it was when i was growing up um you know and it wasn't perfect then because i grew up in the vietnam era but um but it was different it certainly wasn't the way it is now yeah yeah. Hey, here's a fun one. Advice for orange pilling retired folks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, I, I try and orange pill everybody I meet. I show them a money wallet. I transfer some money to them. I show them how easy it is. Um, you know, I, I keep it pretty simple. I, um, 
I say, look, this is a new form of money that a lot of people have accepted. The dogs are eating the food. There's increased adoption all the time and there's a limited supply. So think that through. If there's increased adoption, a limited supply, what's going to happen? Price is going to go up. Yeah. Um, some people in the gold community, a lot of people say to me, I don't like it because it's not physical. It's not real. It's funny money. They point to all the other cryptos, which anger me. And I say, this is different. It's a true technological innovation, solved a problem um, that hadn't been solved before. Think of it as being like the printing press or the light bulb. Um, it will never be solved again. But now that it's solved, it really matters. And it's a, it's a secure digital ledger. We never had digital scarcity before. And now we do. And this is what this is what it looks like. And so you've got a chance to buy your spot on the ledger. And you might think, well, it's not a commodity. A lot of people say, well, you can't touch it or feel it. Therefore, it's got no value. And I, I counter that by saying, well, okay, but before gold even existed, or we used anything like, you know, cattle or wheat as money, we sat in caves and we had ledgers on the wall where you know, had sticks and you, you marked down how many deer I killed and how many deer you killed. And we kept track of who owed who, how many deer. So really money is just social obligations. And at its highest level, money is just a ledger. I mean, there's no, there's nothing physical in your bank. There's just a statement that you see that says you have X number of dollars in your account. So once you understand and, and you can grok that money is a ledger, and then you can further understand that technologically there was an innovation here that created a completely immutable secure ledger with a hundred percent guarantee, mathematical certainty of not dilution and not being overprinted and, not, and no double spend, then you should go, aha, this is a superior form of money. It's even better than gold. And it's easy to move, it's easy to transfer, it's easy to store, and it's defensible against armies because you've got your 12 words, and unless they beat it out of you, they can't steal it from you. So, um, you know, those are the arguments I use, and, and smart people generally eventually come to it, and they have a lot of concerns, but I just, I have an answer for every concern. You can orange pill people at any age. The people who don't seem to be very susceptible to being orange pilled are people who are arrogant. Uh, I, I, seriously, I, I kind of know so that. True. It's so I mean, true. Right? It's I mean, so I, you know, Peter Schiff, I mean, um, Nassim Taleb, I mean, any, it, it's almost a perfect correlation. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it, you know, and, and, and to me, that's because they're trapped. I mean, we're moving into a paradigm where the ego is not as important. I mean, Jeff Booth just started this great venture capital firm called Ego Death Capital. Which I think is a great name for a firm. And so with the ego being less important and, and kind of, you know, collective, you know, this kind of woo-woo stuff, but collective, um, you know, all of us doing well together, working as individuals and in a team um, is kind of, I think, the paradigm that's going to emerge in the next hundred years. Um, decentralized, not centralized. Centralized stuff is evil. Centralized stuff leads to guys like Hitler at the top doing bad so, uh, you know, it's all based on you've got your ego out of it and you're kind of trying to think, well, what's the best for everybody involved? Not what's the best for me, not what's my reptile brain telling me, oh, ego wise, I got to do this, you know, but but there are a lot of reptile brains out there still running around, you know, pounding their chest because they're fearful and they can't see what other people see. And, you know, they, they, they think that by, you know, professing their own brilliance on subjects, and stroking their ego, that will keep them secure. And it prevents them from seeing something that's very obvious when placed right in front of their face. And that's that's kind of how I see it. I love you know? that. You know? um, ego how, death. It's a great name, right? Yeah. How does the bond market finally find Bitcoin? Well, I don't know. I mean, the bond it, market's going to have to It's because it's in a lot of trouble. Is it a know? persistent negative spread? Yeah, I think so. I think that's right. I mean, I think, and and one of the things that, you know, a question that has been asked a lot is how do we live with a world that's deflationary? And for that, you got to read Jeff Booth's book. I'm sure you have. I think others on the yeah. listening yeah. should read it. I mean, it's it's going to be different. In, in the world that's coming, there's not going to be a need to build up the big credit structure that we've had, like mm -hmm. the world we've had looking backwards. You know, you're, you're actually, if you just hold your wealth in the form of Bitcoin or even other property, you're going to get wealthier every year because prices are going to continually fall. I mean, technology leads to everything becoming cheaper over time, and that's always been true. Um, so, you know, there won't be as big a bond market. People say, well, how are there going to be loans in a deflationary environment? The answer is yes, there will be loans. But again, you'll, you'll really want to make sure that the project pays back the mm -hmm. loan. And the person making the loan will probably be willing to make it at a low level of interest. And the reason they're willing to do that is that they know that the fundamental principle will have more buying power in the future. 
Imagine a world where your money got more valuable over time. I know that's really hard to understand, but it's actually a much better world. It's actually a much, much better world. And we had a version of that between 1789 and 1913 because we didn't have a credit-driven society. And so at that point in time, everything, there were a lot of gold mines built. There were a lot of businesses built in that time frame, and they were all built with equity capital, not debt. Mm-hmm. There was very little debt in that time frame. And, and I think that's how it'll look going forward. I don't think the debt market will be nearly as important or nearly as big a thing. The debt market is as big as it is because we're trying to build a Keynesian system that relies on continual growth as the metric for success and that creates that needs debt to create that growth. And both of those are a dead end road. I mean, this is the St. Matthews Island, you know. Everyone's um, a slave in the end. Yeah, everyone's a slave and it's, it's the reindeer problem. I mean, continual growth in a finite planet with finite resources. I mean, how does that work? Yeah. It, it can't. I mean, the only, the only way that, that, that it can work is with increase. I mean, the issue, the thing we should be measuring, not growth, is the thing we should be measuring is productivity. How do we get the most for the least? And, and more productivity is a deflationary thing. Yeah. So everyone's got to change their mindset. We got to throw canes out. We got to get rid of this whole growth mentality. We got to get rid of this whole credit based growth mentality. And we got to go back to a mentality of equity based capital for doing things more efficiently, better, cheaper, faster for less. That's what it's all about. How do we get more for less? And that's a deflationary mindset. And that's the mindset we've got to go toward. And by the way, that fits perfectly with Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a deflationary currency. It's so, it's how nature it's operates. You know, I was yeah. we uh, my this is kind of uh, silly, but my kids and I we uh, recently were growing crystals. We got a little crystal kit and we mix the neat. solution. Yeah. We mix the yeah, solution yeah. together and then you put it you know in a dark spot for two weeks or whatever and and just naturally the molecules that are all of the same type are trying to assemble themselves in the most efficient way possible. Huh. And that's how they, they grow their shapes. And so you just think about like fundamental, and that's not even anything that's, that's living or alive. Right. And it's trying to figure out the most efficient use of energy in order to assemble itself. And so it just makes sense that that's how, you know, things should work. Right. If, if that's how right. nature works, that's how you would think that we would yep. assemble ourselves as well. Hey, uh, this question I really liked, and I'm curious to hear your answer to it. Uh, what are your top three charts that you pay attention to? That was, that was a great question. Um, yeah. So I keep it pretty simple, to be honest with you, because I just look at big investment categories. Um, and I, you know, look, I drill down to things like the two year and so on and so forth. But in general, I'm looking at the stock market, you know, just equities. Um, I'm looking at the bond market, the 10 year yield and the pattern there. I'm looking at the dollar. I'm looking at gold and I'm looking at Bitcoin. And these are all interrelated in terms of investment choices and investment flows. And, you know, they they all tell you part of the picture. I mean, the fact that the dollar is as strong as it is right now tells you the Fed's not printing enough. You know, we've got a deflationary impulse going on right now. The fact that the bond market's rallying right now, same story. Although I'm not sure that rally is going to last. The fact that the stock market's rolling over right now tells you in my mind that we had a bubble and there's not any real value there. And the fact that Bitcoin and gold are getting hammered right now tells you that, you know, the cutting edge of the liquidity spigot, which is, you know, uh, Bitcoin and gold. I mean, Bitcoin is the most volatile and the, and the Bitcoin's the leading indicator, in my opinion, of liquidity in the system. And that's why it's been hammered so hard right now, because the Fed is working very hard to take. They've signaled that they're going to take liquidity out of the system. And so the most liquid thing is telling you where everything else is going to go. And bonds are going to follow, bonds and stocks are going to follow Bitcoin lower. Then they're going to pivot and Bitcoin is going to rip and it's going to go to 200,000 and gold's going to go through 2000 and silver's going to go through 35. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to have an inflationary impulse. that's going to blow people's minds. Oil's going to go to 200. But right now we're in one of those down waves. I mean, you know, Google the Myrmican chart on Twitter. And, you know, when you when you get a monetary system breaking up, you get really wild swings. It's very tough. It's very tough as an investor. I mean, I feel for everybody on this call, this is this is not an easy environment to be investing in. You gotta have a steady hand on the tiller, but I but I'm also very convinced that we're all on the right side of it. 
because you know the, the the government is faced with one of two choices: they can either debase or default. And you know they will not default; they can't. That's instant death. Um, mm-hmm. So they will debase. Now, on what time scale? What you know? In what ways? What measures? Who the hell knows? I mean, that's they're good at you know hiding that, moving moving the piece and shells there. But but they'll do it. They they have to do it. And we know that. And there's no debasing Bitcoin. You know, they're 21 million, period. And um, and there's adoption continuing to grow. So I sleep very well at night knowing that my wealth is safe in Bitcoin. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm absolutely, you know, very peaceful about it all. I, I you know, I, I worry for the country and I see all the stuff going on and that all really upsets me a great deal. But um, in terms of knowing that my savings capital is in the right place, I'm, I'm extremely comfortable with that. That makes two of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. I mean, it's. Um, you know, it, but watching the watching the moves, I mean, Jesus Christ, right? I mean, oh, it's it's wild. wild. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. wild. Hey, I would I would summarize the the charts you're looking at is really trying to understand the liquidity in the system. Um, my three charts because the person asked Preston, uh, they said yeah, what, Preston, were what, were, yeah. what were my three? Um, yeah. So I have a chart that. Uh, was inspired by that Yardini PDF that's updated every day, and it's a consolidation of the central bank balance sheet. So I've created one in, inside a trading view that I consolidated the Fed, the ECB, uh, the Bank of Japan, and the People's Bank of China. I've consolidated all those balance sheets, central bank balance sheets, into a single chart. And then I'm looking at it, and oh my Lord, you can't believe how how much correlation there there is to the major uh, stock indice. So I'm looking at that and I'm seeing, and, and you're talking about the liquidity coming out of the system. I can tell you in the last 10 years, this is the fastest pace you've seen the liquidity coming out of the system uh, since the 2008 crisis. The other chart that I have is a is a consolidated global equity market where I've taken the U.S., Europe, Japan, China, and the Hong Kong uh, stock exchange, and then I market cap weight them based on their their size globally, and I've smushed them all into a single chart. And the reason I'm looking at that is also to kind of identify whether I think liquidity is coming into the global economy or being sucked out. And then like you, I'm looking at the treasury yields. I've been paying a lot of, of attention to the oil market recently, and obviously the the dollar index. But those are the ones that I'm really watching because, I mean, at the end of the day, it, I'm seeing it as a you want to own cash or you want to own Bitcoin kind of world these days. And if and if they're tightening collectively on a global scale, I want to be stacking dollars so that I can buy a bunch of Bitcoin when they change their mind. That's pretty I, much it. I, I think that's right. I mean, I yeah. Some people on the questions ask, do I think you know? I, I think the bottom's in for Bitcoin at seventeen five, but I've often been wrong on this. It could go lower. I've got a really great chart that maybe I'll shoot you and you can put it in the show notes. It was done by an Elliott Wave guy that shows 13.8 on Bitcoin is a 78.6% retracement. Mm. So if we have one more impulse move down there, that would probably be where it would stop. But I And if it does, my sense is you might have to be very quick. It might not be there for very long. Yeah. But I, I actually honestly think we're kind of done. That 17.5 was it. But uh, to be fair, back in 2017, when we went from 17,000 down to nine, I thought we were done at nine, and then we went to 3,500. Yeah. So, I, you know, I could be wrong. It could go a bit lower, but, um, you know, they're not making any more of it. I mean, they are making more, but it's, it's as you know, the supply is growing very slowly. And, and the adoption is just, I mean, the only two things that would ever concern me would be if the technology were in some way proven to be flawed, and it hasn't been for a long time now, so I'm not too worried about that anymore. Or if the adoption were to stop or slow or reverse, and I just don't see that. Everywhere I go, everything I read, everybody I talk to, there are just more and more people using it all, every day. The use cases are just so they're so fabulous. I mean, this whole, you know, this, I, I don't know if you've done transactions with Mun and the Lightning Wallet, but oh, it's unreal. You know, or if you've read Alex Gladstein's book about how he's orange pilling people all over the world, I mean, I'm telling you, man, people everywhere are are starting to use this stuff more and more. And you know, once you get hooked on it you realize what you can do with it. Um, yeah. you know, you're not going, you're not going back. No. So and there's a fixed supply. So it's, it's all, it's all pretty good. What other questions did you have? For, this for this is my last one for you, Larry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And boy, that hour went fast. Let me tell you. That was an hour. <laughs> we can go longer if you want. <laughs> that went really fast. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Your philosophy values on living a worthwhile life. For my yeah, last question, that's a, that's a great question. Well, I um, I'll say right up front, I'm probably I'm a Christian. Um, you know, kind of raised and, and believe deeply in that, but I I don't criticize anyone who's not because I think it uh, more broadly I'm spiritual because and I know a lot of people don't like organized religion. Um, you know, I think we're all put here for a higher purpose. We all have a mission and, uh, and we're, you know, we're here to do our job and we just got to do the best we can do and live honorable lives and, uh, contribute what we're capable of contributing and respect everybody else and what they're trying to do and what they're contributing. And to the degree that we see things that we think aren't right, we're, we're told to stand up to it and to try and fight it. And, um, you know, so in my particular case, like my highest and best use is figuring shit out. I'm, I've always been an analyst. I like analyzing stuff. It's fun and I'm decent at it. And then, um, you know, what I see is wrong is what has happened, what some powerful people have done and have lived off a system that has benefited them at the expense of millions. And so I view it to the degree that I've got the strength and the will to do it is important to, to fight you know, to fight that. So I'm, wow. I'm very vocally and, and not, not ashamedly an advocate for sound money and, and critical of people who I think um, have, have made this world a worse place. And I, I aim, you know, I point directly at the central banks. You know, yeah. I, I want to see, I want to see Ben Bernanke not a hero. I want to see Ben Bernanke in the history books as John Law, you know, which is where he belongs. He's a, he's a fraud and a charlatan. And uh, he's caused enormous pain for lots of people. And, and he wasn't the first. I mean, there have been plenty before him and there'll be more after him. But um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, you could call me kind of a, a Christian warrior <laughs> uh, for for what for the values that I believe in. And, um, you know, uh, that, I want that to be my legacy. I love that. I love that. It's it's not being a parasite. Like the, the behaviors exactly. that we're seeing right now are so parasitic where they're yeah. taking energy from others to, to, for themselves. Right. And it, you're trying yeah. to look for how can we make this an environment that is beneficial for all? Well, that's and, right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think, you know, I think the, I think all human beings have an innate sense. I mean, they, and they say this even in animals, chimps, and others have an innate sense of fairness. Yes. And I think, and, and I think that if there's one role that government can serve or should serve is to try to be a good referee and to keep the playing field level and fair. And unfortunately, I don't think our government comes anywhere close to that. It doesn't even begin. Um, but that to me, that's, you know, if one's secured, you know, enough food and uh, shelter to, to live a decent life, then, you know, helping others or fighting for fairness, I think are two very noble causes. Yes. And in my case, I don't, I don't help a lot of others, but I, but I am fighting for fairness. <laughs> well, you're sharing knowledge and that is yeah. a very important thing because then they can share it with others at minimal to no friction, right? I guess so. so. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I'm happy to share knowledge. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, um, it's good stuff, folks. I mean, we're, we're all going to be fine. We just got to hang out and keep fighting. Um, this Mun Wallet's a powerful thing. M U U N. Anybody who doesn't have one should get one. You can instantly send in a lightning transaction. The last one I sent cost me seven sats. I don't know what seven sats. But about it's not much. It's not it's four, much. Forty-nine sats to a penny, right? Right, roughly, right now. So what? Seven sats is one, you know, one seventh of a penny, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it's unreal. It is unreal. And, and I like to send a very small amount over it to demo it, and it's like. Well, I just sent you half a penny, and, oh, it's, I don't, I, and it's like it's like, what do you mean you sent me the, immediately, right? And if I wanted it to be ten thousand, I could have sent you ten thousand dollars immediately. Like yeah. it's just, it's unreal. It's yeah, I usually send a buck, and and they're just. I did it the other day with a professor, and he he was just blown away. He was like, yeah. what? How much did that cost you?" So it cost me less than a seventh of a penny. He's like, "That's impossible." So, no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. It's working. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I love it when you can route it through your own node and it's like, Hey, that's yeah. encrypted over tour. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, like that yeah. went and pinged my house and then sent you, it's, it's just crazy. Yeah. How, how, well, how does and, anybody and that, stop that? They don't. And that's yeah. the other beautiful thing about lightning. My understanding of it, as you know, the chain is pretty easy to do analytics on and track and then yeah. work. 
yeah. think lightning is going to be really hard to super track. hard super right hard. yes so you know this whole cbdc you know we're going to surveil you we're going to know where all your money goes etc cetera, etc cetera. you know oh really you know with lightning i'm not so sure and then if you listen to odell and this fediment thing that he's working on i mean that's going to be another layer of security i mean the good news is these technologies are coming along so quickly mm-hmm. that they, are, they don't have a chance i mean yeah. we're they just don't have a chance. We're we're gonna run these people over, and it's gonna be so much fun. It's yeah. really gonna be fun, and they and they so richly deserve it. You know, <laughs> they really do. It's an so, exciting time to be alive. It is. It really is. I mean, you know, if you can just get over the number, go down. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been a painful couple months for people that yeah. are comparing it to the to the dollar and and not looking in a very long time horizon of five That's to ten thing. years. But yeah, life's a lot more than number go up, number go down. Having been in the financial markets for a long time, I can assure people that things are never as bad as they feel in a bear market, and they're never as good as they feel in a bull market. In a bull market, yeah, yeah, and it's just. You know, you gotta you gotta take the good with the bad. I mean, uh, you know, going from five thousand to sixty nine thousand is pretty damn exciting, a lot of fun, and you know that brings a tr- check back to seventeen five. So be it. Yeah. You know, the next run, I think the next run will probably take us into the low two hundreds. So uh, that'll be nice. <laughs> Bill Miller talks about his, him riding Amazon the whole way up and talking about how much volatility was involved. Oh, really? In, in that ride. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, people look at it and are like, oh, well, you bought Amazon and rode it the whole way to the top. Like it was just this smooth uh-huh. sailing, like adventure of just making money the whole ride without any type of volatility that you're stomaching through that rise, me- meteoric rise. And um, this is obviously, I, I suspect, and you suspect that we're in same a same thing. Yeah. Same thing. It's funny, too. Amazon informed me on Bitcoin. I mean, it was a network investment. And I didn't understand it because it didn't make money. And so I never bought it. It was a big regret on my part that I didn't mm-hmm. buy it. I mean, partly it was funded by free capital. So that, you know, that was, I just couldn't buy something that didn't make money. But um, the network effect there was extremely powerful. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what we got going on with Bitcoin. I mean, I, I invested in the internet back in 95 or 93, actually, and, and did well with it. And I was saying on another podcast the other day, this reminds me exactly of the internet. It's the exact same story. Yeah. And this is, you know, we're at the point now where this will be ubiquitous within five or 10 years. Yeah. And those of us who are in it now will, you know, have benefited very substantially from being in it. So, um, you know, it is exciting. It's It's extremely exciting. Let's just hope that you know, the central banks don't completely crater the world economy and that some of the psychopaths in our society don't decide that having a nuclear exchange is a worthwhile thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Larry, give folks a handoff uh, to your Twitter account, which yeah. is awesome to follow and anything oh, else you. that you want to highlight. Yeah, no, just I'll just say my Twitter account. I do a lot of sh- posting, but I also put some useful stuff on there, too. It's at Lawrence Lepard. And then I have a website that has my quarterly letters and a lot of things on there about sound money and a white paper on Bitcoin that I wrote six, four years ago, I guess now. Uh, and that website is EMA. And my business name is Equity Management Associates, but EMA, Edward Mark Alpha, the number two dot com. And that's all free, just information. Awesome. We'll have links. Thanks to very that. much, Chris. It's great to see you again. I'm sure we'll see you again. Oh, conference. yeah. Likewise, Larry. It was awesome seeing you and looking forward to the next time we're able to meet up in person. Yeah, likewise. Okay. Thank have you, a sir. Good day. Take care. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.